Well, good morning, everyone. We'll come back to that little scenario in a few minutes, and we'll begin each one of our mornings, the next couple of mornings, with a scene like that as we think together about neighboring. I think you're beginning to get the hang of it. Got a lot of howdy neighbors as I walked around camp yesterday from folks and saw some people meeting each other and getting to know the folks who are next door to them, even if they're not related. Uh, So that was nice to see. I was behind somebody in the uh, buffet line yesterday for lunch, right behind him, and he started stacking up chicken drumsticks on his plate. Five, six, seven, eight, a stack of them. Finally, he looks at me sheepishly and says, they're not all for me. I'm getting some for my neighbor. (laughs) So I don't know if he was just gaming me or what, but... He got an attaboy from me, so... Well, yesterday we introduced our series with one of the most beloved TV neighbors of all time, Mr. Rogers, and he seemed to resonate, and some of you have said you still have that song in your head, and uh, so that's a good way to get started. But depending on your particular age and generation, you probably have some other TV neighbors who are coming to your mind, and they're not all as lovable as Mr. Rogers. So, for instance, some of you here will remember Fred and Ethel Mertz from the mother of all TV sitcoms, I Love Lucy. If you came of age in the 60s and the 70s, you're probably thinking of Mrs. Kravitz, the nosy neighbor from next door in the Bewitched series. Or maybe Archie Bunker's nemesis, Lionel Jefferson, drove Archie nuts. Later generations might think of Steve Urkel, the uh, nerdy next-door neighbor from uh, Family Matters, or ditzy Kimmy Gibber from Full House. Then, of course, there was Wise Wilson dispensing advice from uh, across the fence uh, and a home improvement, and my favorite, the zany Cosmo Kramer, (laughs) sliding into Jerry's apartment from across the hall. But of all the quirky TV neighbors out there, the one most uncomfortably relevant to our conversation has to be the church-going, Bible-quoting, next-diddly-door neighbor Ned Flanders living next door to Homer Simpson. Ned is cheerful and kind and helpful and annoyingly perfect. And Homer doesn't know whether to love him or hate him. Well, what kind of neighbor do you want to be? And what kind of neighbor might Jesus have been? Now, we think about Jesus in all kinds of roles. He's a teacher. He's a leader. He's a prophet. He's a servant. He's a Lord. He's a Messiah. He's the master. All those things just roll off our tongues. We forget that Jesus was also a neighbor. He grew up in a small town. There were people next door and across the street. He had playmates when he was a child. He had classmates in school. He had merchants that he and his family bought groceries from. He had customers that he did business with. And even after he left home at the age of 30 and hit the road, he still had everyday interactions with people he bumped bumped into as he made his way through all of his uh, activities from day to day. Jesus was a neighbor. What kind of neighbor would he have been? How did he relate to the everyday people in his life? So yesterday, we heard Jesus' foundational words on this subject. Love your neighbor as yourself. Simple, but incredibly profound and challenging. I'm guessing they were so challenging that you probably walked out of here with a few questions. It all sounds wonderful, loving your neighbor, but what exactly does it mean, practically speaking? And love is certainly important, but what about truth and righteousness? Aren't those things important too? And how do we love people who we don't know, who are far away, maybe on the other side of the world? And the whole family on the Mexican border situation, that's certainly a loaded question. So what exactly does it mean to love people in that complicated situation? If you walked out of here yesterday saying, it all sounds good, but what about? Then that's exactly where Jesus wants you to be. Jesus had no problem sending people away from a sermon, scratching their heads a little bit, saying, I wonder what he means by that. I mean, he very intentionally dropped this grenade on that group of people, and you can be sure they walked away from that conversation saying, wait a second, what about those Samaritans? 
And what exactly does he mean? So you're asking all the right questions, and we'll try to address some of them as we make our way through the week here. But turns out, loving your neighbor wasn't something Jesus just talked about. It was something he actually did. As he made his way through daily life, he loved the people around him. And we actually have quite a collection of neighboring stories that we find in the Gospels. And we're going to look at a few for the next couple of days. Each morning, we'll try to just offer a few simple words, a few simple phrases that try to reduce this neighboring thing to something practical and manageable. And today, we're going to learn that neighbors know each other. That seems pretty obvious, but turns out to be harder for us than it might sound. The State Farm Insurance Agency is famous for neighboring like a good neighbor. They did a study some years ago, not that many years ago, and discovered that uh, only about 25% of Americans know the names of their neighbors, their next-door neighbors. So I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you know first and last names of the people who live on either side and maybe across the street or behind you. Another study reports that only about 20% of Americans say they spend any time at all with their neighbors. So again, won't ask for a show of hands, but when was the last time you spent more than five minutes with someone in your neighborhood? So maybe we should start at this most basic level, that loving your neighbor means knowing your neighbor. But how do you do that? I mean, if these statistics are only half right, we are not so good at this. So, so let's follow Jesus around a little bit. Let's join Jesus in a fairly random encounter he has with an everyday person in his life and see what we can learn about knowing our neighbors. We'll give you the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Now notice, this is not Jesus' neighborhood. Okay, This is another town, the town of Nain. It was five-some miles away, so he probably wouldn't have known these people. When we talk about neighbors, we're not just talking about the people who live geographically next to us. We're talking about people we might bump into in the course of everyday life. And notice that Jesus already has a crowd with him. Okay, Luke tells us it's a large crowd. That crowd probably included his disciples. It probably included some curiosity seekers, and it probably included some critics as well. So Jesus has his hands full relationally as he heads into town. He's not lonely or alone. And I'm guessing that's true for most of us. Most of our lives are pretty full of people. We've got our family and our extended family. We've got our friends. We've got the people that we work with and for. We've got folks from our church. Most of us probably are not looking for more names to add to our dance card, so to speak. And Jesus probably wasn't either. He had plenty of relationships on this particular day. And as as he and his crew make their way into town, they bump into another crew heading out of town. But this was a funeral procession, a fairly common occurrence in their culture and even in ours as well. The point is both of these crowds are on their way somewhere. Both of them are groups of people who have people around them and are going somewhere else and have some place to, to go and to be. But in spite of all that, he's got a crowd with him. He's on his way somewhere. He's got something to do. He stops and he notices this crowd. He not only notices the crowd, he notices one person in that crowd, a bereaved woman. Luke tells us very specifically when the Lord saw her. Now, again, we can pretty safely assume that Jesus didn't know this woman. She's from another town and people didn't travel. They didn't have cars to drive five miles away. He probably didn't know anything about this woman. And yet he seems to have discerned pretty quickly her situation. First, that she's a widow, that this was her only son. Now, how did Jesus know all that? I suppose one answer would be that Jesus knew because he's the Son of God and he knows everything, and that's possible. But generally, that's not how things work in the Gospels. Generally, Jesus makes his way through life the way you and I make our way through life, using the mind and the body and the senses that God has given to us and relying on the prompting of God's Holy Spirit within us as we go. All that to say, I think Jesus 
assess this woman's situation simply by paying attention to her. I don't think Jesus walked around with a dossier, a database in his head uh, of, <clears throat> of every human being who we would ever bump into. I think he figured it out as he went. Kind of like Sherlock Holmes does. You know Holmes. Whether you like the old Basil Rathbone, uh, Sherlock Holmes, or Benedict Cumberbatch, you know Sherlock Holmes. He notices everything. The dirt under someone's fingernails. The dog hair on the back of someone's coat. The way someone quickly looks away when they're asked where they were last night. All those things are telling him something. I think Jesus noticed things like that. I think Jesus noticed that there was no husband walking in front of this woman. I think he noticed there were no sons walking beside her. I think he noticed the ages of the people in the procession, suggesting that the person who died was a younger person. I think he noticed the intensity of the grief and the size of the crowd, suggesting that this was kind of a tragic situation, that someone had died way before their time, and that this presented this woman with a desperate situation. And that, I would suggest, is the first way we get to know our neighbors as well, is simply by noticing, by paying attention, our eyes and ears and our instincts, and the prompting of the Spirit to tell us what's happening in the lives of people around us. Jesus does this all the time. He notices children being shoved away by his disciples. He, he spots a, a tax collector hiding up in a tree. He hears a a, a beggar calling from the street behind him. He feels a woman tug on his cloak in the middle of a crowded street. He notices everything, and he especially notices people. And we can do the very same thing. Neighbors notice. They pay attention. They use the senses God has given to discern who's around and what might be happening in their lives. Now, Karen and I try to grab a quick breakfast together every morning before we head off to work. And the way our home is situated, the table's right in front of the front window so we can see the street in front of our of our house. And so every morning, we literally watch our neighbors parade by. It begins with the, the high school girl from two houses, houses down as she makes her way very deliberately on her way to school, walking briskly because she wants to get to school on time. A little while later, the middle school boys follow. And they're shuffling their feet, not quite as briskly as they make their way to middle school. And then about 90 seconds later, a fourth middle school boy comes running after them. The kid's late every single day, same drill. So they go that way, and then the empty nest ladies come walking this way. Their kids are gone and out of the house. So they're out for a walk with each other in the morning. And they're having conversations about the kids and the grandkids and which house sold for how much in the neighborhood. And they make their way off this direction. Every few days, the jogger comes by. And she's running a little more slowly than she did 10 years ago, running by at this very same time. Then the guy across the street backs out of the driveway and heads off to work, unless it's Friday when he works at home. You get the idea. It's like the Truman Show. (laughs) Cue the dog walker. It's the same drill every day. Now, on the one hand, it's very ordinary and very predictable. At the same time, it's telling a story. All these people have lives, places they're going, things they're dealing with, pursuits that they're after. Things happening so that some days they walk with a spring in their step and some days their shoulders are slumped as they make their way along. Now, it's nice to know what time they try to get to school and where they work, but what else might we learn about them if we pay closer attention, if we listen and think and reflect? The better we know them, the more likely we are to love them, and the better able we are to love them. So I already talked about how little most Americans actually know about their neighbors. I read about a church that decided to do something about that. So the pastor created this neighborhood grid, kind of like the one that you received when you came in here today. A little map with eight spaces to help help his people figure out who their neighbors were. He decided to start with the pastoral staff. So he handed out to his pastoral staff, and he asked the staff to, to fill in the names of eight neighbors and some details about their lives, where they're from, what they do for a living, that sort of thing. Needless to say, they didn't do very well. In fact, they did so poorly filling in the names of their neighbors that 
they ended up calling it the chart of shame. Because they realized their lives were so preoccupied with their professional ministry and their church relationships, they weren't even connecting with the people who were part of their everyday lives. So that little exercise became the starting point of a transformation in that church. They made this the singular focus of their church's ministry to love their neighbors. It's their mantra. It's their slogan. It's who they are. It's their brand. Now, you can read about it. They wrote it up in a couple of books, The Art of Neighboring and the Neighboring Church, and I actually ordered some from the bookstore. So if you're interested, you can pick one up. But I gave you one of these to to begin helping you thinking about who your neighbors are. So I'm going to encourage you these next few days in chapel and as we're around camp to start filling in the names of some of those folks, jotting in some details about their lives. I encourage you, don't try to fill it in all at once. Wait for the Lord to bring some people to mind. And don't make them all people who live right near you. They might be other people in your life that you bump into. So just use that over the next few days to begin thinking about who your neighbors are. Now, we haven't yet actually offered a definition for this neighbor thing, so let me try this one. A neighbor is any person God calls to my attention and within my sphere of influence. Any person God calls to my attention and within my sphere of influence. So a neighbor can be anyone, someone as close as next door or as far away as across the world. It can be someone you know. It can be a complete stranger. A neighbor can be anyone. But a neighbor isn't everyone. Everyone is impossible. We can't be neighbors to everyone in the whole world. Neighbors are people the Lord calls to our attention and within our sphere of influence. Now, there are many ways we can influence people, and we'll be talking about that as we go. But let's just think about this call to our attention for a minute. People the Lord calls to our attention, who he brings across our path. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that we just passively wait for someone, the Lord to literally throw someone across our path. It means we pay attention. We look, we listen, we watch, we slow down, we make time. And we, we, we pay attention to people and to the prompting of the Spirit within. And we talked yesterday about how loving God and loving one another, loving others goes together. We talked about being kind is as important as having your daily devotions. You need the two of them because your daily devotions is when you tune in to the Holy Spirit, when you begin your day by getting on the same wavelength with the Lord and tuning your eye, your ears, and your spirit to the prompting of the Spirit. So as you make your way through the day, the the Spirit can prompt you. So these two things go together. So it's a skill we can develop, a practice that we can call, that we can cultivate, paying attention to the people we encounter. Second thing I want you to notice is that Jesus doesn't just notice this woman, he empathizes with her. He takes the time to consider her feelings and even enter into her feelings. Look down at verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. What a tender scene this is. I love this picture of Jesus. Here he is surrounded by all these people. Some of them are asking him questions. Some of them are begging for miracles. Some of them are looking to trip him up. He's he's come to this town to preach and teach, so he's got a mission. He's already thinking about the message he's going to give later that day. That's on his mind. And then here comes this funeral procession, and this woman he notices, and suddenly he stops And he notices her, and he feels for her, and he says to her, don't cry. But now why her? Jesus must have encountered many funeral processions in the course of his travels for those three years. Why does he notice this one? And why does he notice this woman in particular? Could it be that he's thinking about his own mother? Someday accompanying her son's lifeless body out to a gravesite? Could he be anticipating his own mother's grief? Already feeling the burden of who will provide for her after he's gone? See, Jesus isn't just 
having sympathy for her, feeling for her. He has empathy for her. He's feeling with her. Now, there's nothing wrong with sympathy. It's important to feel for others. But empathy means where I, we can feel for people as, because they've gone through or we're going through a similar experience. We can understand one another's life experiences. And when we can do that, it increases our neighboring potential exponentially. In fact, I think that's one of the ways the Lord calls neighbors to your attention, people you can empathize with. So if you know how it feels to lose a loved one or to battle cancer or to bring home a new baby or to be the new person in the neighborhood, and that happens to someone around you, well, the Lord might just be calling that person to your attention because you've been there before and the two of you can connect easily. Empathy. So neighbors don't just notice, neighbors feel. So let's think for a minute about that woman on the airplane, the scenario we described in that opening video. As you settle into your seat, you notice that she's upset, maybe even crying. I mean, it's hard not to notice things like that in the close quarters of an airplane. So, so, so what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you, you at least notice that. You, 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 before you power up your computer, you at least notice who's around you and you notice she's upset. And it begins right there. But then what do you do? Do you take out your book or a laptop so she doesn't feel conspicuous about her, her distress? Maybe so. Maybe you sense that's the right thing to do. Just give her her privacy. But maybe what you do is you just hand her an extra tissue without saying a word. That's the way of kind of saying, I know you're upset and whatever it is, I feel, I'm sorry about that. Maybe you actually do allow your eyes to meet and you give her a smile. Again, just to say, I'm sorry you're upset, whatever it is, but it's okay. And maybe you actually say the words. Um, I, don't, I don't know what's happening, but I can see you're upset and I just want you to know I'm sorry about that. I hope it turns out okay. Any one of those things provides a human connection at a moment when it might mean the world to a person. Jesus shows us how to do that, how to make those kinds of connections. You know what it's like to get on a plane with a heavy heart, even if you've never been through what she's going through. Maybe you allow yourself to imagine what it might be she's going through. Maybe, maybe she just lost a loved one. She's on her way to or from a funeral. Maybe she just dropped her first child off at college and she's sad about leaving him there. Or maybe there are different kind of tears. <laughs> yeah, now you get it, right? right? Maybe she just said goodbye to her fiancé and she's not going to see him for a long time. Maybe she just broke up with her fiancé. Maybe she's on her way to a new life, a new, a new place to live, a new job in a new part of the country. You know what it's like to get on a plane with a heavy heart and to, so, so to simply acknowledge that and allow yourself to feel for a moment what she's feeling. That's an act of neighboring. Remember, Jesus told us we're to love our neighbors as ourselves because they're human like us. They have the same hopes and fears and dreams and pains that we do. William Urey is a... Harvard anthropologist, author, he's a TED talker. He wrote the best-selling book on negotiation called uh, Getting to Yes. And William Urey says that every human being has a deep need for his or her feelings to be recognized. When we do that for or with someone, when we affirm their humanity, that is an act of love. It's an act of neighboring. Empathy is powerful. And parents, just a little aside here. This is something you can actually help your children with. Empathy is a developmental task of childhood and adolescence. Human beings don't come into the world empathizing. (laughs) We all know that. They come in focused on themselves. They have to learn to feel for and with others. And you can help your children do that. My mother was very intentional about that. I remember it growing up. I might come home from school and talk about a, a, a weird kid at school who nobody's friends with or, or someone who'd been mean to me or some bully. 
And she would hear me out, and then she would inevitably say something like, I wonder how it feels. How do you think it feels to be that person, to that boy or that girl? What do you think makes him or her act that way? And it made me slow down a little bit and try to put myself in someone other's shoes, someone else's shoes. And that's a skill you can cultivate, a heart you can cultivate. And Jesus shows us how to do it. Empathy. Now Jesus actually acts on that impulse and he engages the woman. He approaches her and he says, don't cry. Now, quick point of clarification, because all the therapists in the room will tell you that's the absolutely wrong thing to say to a grieving person. Someone's grieving, they have every right to cry or to not cry. So you should never tell a grieving person how to grieve. Understand, this is a unique situation. When Jesus says to her, don't cry, he's not telling her not to cry because it's inappropriate or because he's uncomfortable with it. He's saying, don't cry because he's about to give her a really good reason not to cry. So he knows what's happening. The point isn't what Jesus said. It's that he said something. He reached out. He engaged. He entered into her experience and let her know that someone noticed her. Someone felt her grief. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. And so sometimes on that airplane seat, you reach out and you extend the tissue or a smile or even a word. But even if you decide the best thing to do is to give someone their privacy, just allowing yourself to feel for and with them is an act of neighboring. So let's come back for a moment to that challenging topic we raised yesterday. I actually blundered into it because it wasn't even in my script, but the family on the Mexican border which prompts all kinds of questions. Because we know that's a very complicated situation. I think we all understand. We have to have some control over who comes into the country and how they come into the country. It's not responsible to anyone just to have people come and go without any sort of knowledge of who they are or where they're going. And we know, too, there are people who are waiting legally to get into the country for, by a proper legal process. We certainly want to do, be fair to them. At the same time, we know that many of these families are desperate. Not all of them, for sure. There are some people coming for the wrong reasons, but some of them are desperate. They're trying to escape poverty or violence. They're running for their lives. I mean, how desperate do you have to be, parents? to pack up all your belongings in a couple of plastic bags, strap a baby on your back, put your toddler in your arms, and start walking hundreds of miles towards a country you know nothing about and a language you can't speak and hope that someone somewhere might help you get to a place of safety. Desperate people do desperate things, sometimes foolish and reckless things, sometimes even illegal things. All I'm saying is is let's just feel what they're feeling. I don't understand the political solutions to all of that. It's very complicated to figure out. It's way above my pay grade. And we all might have different solutions for how we address this problem. And we should hear each other out because together we arrive at better solutions. But it begins, loving begins with the people at the heart of the situation and feeling what they're feeling and then beginning to say, how can we responsibly and lovingly address that problem. And so neighbors notice each other. Neighbors feel for each other. But there's one more thing that neighbors can do as they know each other. Let's just finish up the story here in verses 14 and 15. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. So Jesus decides he has to intervene. He has to do something here. And so he approaches the the bier, and he actually, it was the platform on which they would carry the body, just wrapped, but not not completely wrapped and anointed yet, to carry the body out to the gravesite. And Jesus touches the bier. Luke includes that detail. And it's a remarkable detail. Because a spiritual person would never touch a funeral beer because now they're unclean. And they have to go get themselves purified again. Apparently, Jesus isn't concerned 
about ritual purity. He's not concerned about the hassle and the headache and the misunderstanding that it might provide. He just feels like he has to enter in, and so he touches. Neighboring can be messy sometimes. And then he does a remarkable, completely unexpected thing. He speaks to the dead body. Young man, I say to you, get up. And the man sits up. Like a scene from a bad zombie movie, he sits up. And then he begins to talk. Luke tells us that. He begins to teach. Don't you wonder what he said? Hey, where's everyone going? Why the long faces? It's a remarkable scene. And then, what is perhaps the most beautiful moment in the whole scene? We're told that Jesus gives him back to his mother. Now, what did that look like? Did he help the young man down from the beer? take him by the hand, take the mother by the hand, and put those two hands together. What a moment. You talk about being a good neighbor. State Farm can't do that. (laughs) To put them back together. What a beautiful scene. And if we had time, we could remind ourselves and think about the fact that someday, Jesus will do that for all of us and the people we have lost in Christ. Parents, children, spouses, friends, people we have laid to rest often way before we were ready for that. People who might have been sitting next to you in this chapel for a long time. People you miss in Christ someday. He will put our hands into their hands and we will be together again for all of eternity. That is a remarkable hope. And Jesus can and will do that. So it's a, it's a hope that's secured through faith in Jesus Christ, which is why we want it so badly for everybody that we love. But, but as wonderful as this moment is, this is not something we can do for our neighbors. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Only Jesus could have done this. We can't bring people back. We can't heal our neighbor's diseases. We can't deliver them from whatever evil has hold of their lives. But we can do the next best thing, and that's to pray for them. We can bring their name and their need before the one who can do those things, who can restore them and heal them and deliver them. And so neighbors pray for each other. Now, some of you are sticklers, and you're looking at this account, and you're saying, wait a second. There's nothing here that says Jesus prayed, and you're right. But there's another story, a lot like this one, that suggests to me that Jesus prayed. You know the story I'm thinking about. Another young man who died before his time, Lazarus. Remember how Jesus stood outside the tomb? And before he spoke to to that dead man, Jesus likes to talk to dead people, before he speaks to that young man, he looks to heaven, John says, and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I do this for their benefit that they may know that you sent me. See, Jesus had already prayed for Lazarus. Jesus had been praying for Lazarus from the moment he heard that Lazarus was sick a few days earlier. From that moment, Jesus began to say, Father, what's happening here? What are you doing in this young man's life and in this family's life? And what part do you want me to play in this circumstance? And he'd been praying all the way on the journey there and even outside the tomb there. In fact, he looks to heaven so that everyone knows he's praying. I have no doubt that Jesus was praying for this woman the very moment he noticed her. Lord, what's happening with this woman? And what role do you want me to play? And he understands that his role is to bring this young man back to life. And we can do that too. We can pray for the neighbors God calls to our attention, the neighbors for whom we feel some empathy and say, Lord, what are you doing in their lives? How can I be a part of whatever it is you want to happen there? So neighbors notice, neighbors feel, and neighbors pray. And so back to that airplane, the woman you're sitting next to who's upset. 
And maybe you decide in the end that reaching out to her, speaking to her, even giving her tissue, that's just too much. You feel as though all the Lord wants you to do is pray for her. That is not an act of cowardice. That is not copping out. That is not a lame way to assuage your guilt. That is an act of love. To take a moment and intentionally bring that woman before the Lord in prayer. Lord, whatever's happening in this woman's life, I have no idea. But may you comfort her. May you use this experience to point her towards you now or someday. And if there's anything you would have me to do today, please show me what it is. Amen. That is an act of love. And when we do that, we release, we invite God's life-saving, life-changing power into any person's life. Any person you can do that for. And so back one more time to our neighbors on the border. What can we do for a family in Mexico or on the Mexican border? There's not a lot we can do. We can send some money. There are organizations there. World Relief, I know, has a fund. They're working with people there. You can give. But one of the things you can do is we can pray. We can pray for our government that we might put our best minds together across the aisle to figure out solutions to this problem. We can pray for the agencies the government agencies, the, the, the NGOs, the Christian agencies that are working there. We can pray for local churches in those border towns, many of whom are taking some of these families into their homes, their, their, their church members' homes. We can pray for those families themselves that they might have courage and wisdom and that ultimately they will land in a safe place wherever it happens to be. We can pray. And, and that's powerful. That's an act of love. And that's where our response begins. And so I encourage you to pray over that neighboring grid I handed out to you as you begin filling in names there. Ask the Lord to call to your attention the names he wants you to write down there. Don't do it just too quickly. That's why it takes some time. Even, even after you get home, don't fill them all in right away. Wait and see who the Lord calls to your attention. And as you get to know your neighbors, you'll find yourselves praying more intentionally, more faithfully, more boldly, and more passionately for them. I'll tell you very honestly, there are times in my life, seasons when I've been really good about praying for my neighbors, consistent, thoughtful, intentional, and there's times I've been really lousy at it. When I just get distracted and lose focus or consumed by my own things and I kind of lose sight. And I can tell you this, in those seasons when I am praying thoughtfully and intentionally for my neighbors, I have way more opportunities to actually get involved with my neighbors conversations and encounters that I never would have had otherwise. And in the past few months, as I've been working with all these themes and topics, and I've been praying more intentionally, I've had many more of those experiences. And I had one just a few weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon, Karen and I often go for a walk after after church, after we get home. We kind of debrief the day, the morning. How did things go? Who was there? Who wasn't there? Who'd you talk to? What'd you think of the sermon? You know... Loaded question for a pastor's spouse. You just kind of think it. So we were out for our Sunday afternoon walk, and we were going towards a lake that's about a mile away from us through some woods on a trail that we like. And as we were walking along and talking, we stopped beside the lake just to kind of take in the view. And across the lake, up on a little bluff, I noticed a man sitting on a bench. There's a little bench up there where you can enjoy the view. And for some reason, I noticed the man. I don't know why, because we were talking about something else, but I just saw the man. And I remember wondering, will he still be there when we get around to that side of the lake? And we continued on our way, and sure enough, 10 or 15 minutes later, we came around that side of the lake. He was still sitting on the bench, young man. So we both kind of said hi to each other and commented on the view, and, and then he said, I come out here every day. And I said, hey, that, that's a great idea. You can kind of, you know, watch the season change as things go. I figured we were just kind of making small talk for a moment. And then he said, I'm staying over here at the VA. There's a big Veterans Administration hospital just on the other side of the woods. He went on to tell us that he was a vet, that he was at the hospital for a time recovering from his tour of duty, recovering both physically and psychologically. He'd actually become addicted to painkillers, recovering from what happened there. And he actually rolled back the sleeves on his arm and showed us the needle marks from the drugs he'd been using. 
And he told us a story. And I was, I was just so, but he said he was determined to beat it. And I was so inspired by this young man's courage. First, his willingness to go off and serve our country. And then to come back and fight this battle and fight his way back to health. I said, way to go, man. I'm proud of you. Don't give up. He said, yeah, I'm not. He seemed encouraged. We chat a little while longer about this and that. And then I said, you know, we go to this really good church just down the road here. <laughs> the pastor is killer. I, mean, <laughs> I said, you know, if, if you could ever find your way there, it's a great group of people. You know, I'm sure you'd love it. He said, yeah, hey, thanks a lot. We chat a little more. And then I finally said, uh, you know, what, what's your name? He said, Andy. And I shook his head and said, Andy, I'm just, I'm going to pray for you. He said, thanks, man. And we kind of went on our way. Now, it was about a five-minute interaction. That's all. Five minutes we spent together on that hill. And in retrospect, I look back in the days after, I said, you know, should I have done more? Maybe I should have prayed with him right there. Why didn't I pray with him right there? Should have, should I, I should have offered him a ride to church or given him the four spiritual laws. Or I don't know. <laughs> you know, did I blow it? I don't know. I'm, I'm still learning this neighboring thing. Will he come to church? Did he come to church? I don't know. Will he find another when he goes home? I don't know. I don't know where it will lead. In fact, I even tried to, I called the, the hospital the next day, the chaplain's office, to see if I could track him down. It just didn't work out. So in the end, I just have to leave it in the Lord's hands. I don't know where it will lead. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was our one and only interaction. But you know, for those few moments, we were neighbors to each other. We made a human connection in a beautiful place. And he revealed something about himself, and I revealed something about myself. And I was inspired by his courage, and he was encouraged by our support. And I don't know what the Lord might do with it from there. And that may be all there is to it. That's neighboring. Friends, What a great way to live like that. What a better... A a, a Sunday afternoon walk becomes a God divine, divinely appointed moment in two people's lives. What a wonderful command this is. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we live this way, when we love this way, as Jesus said yesterday, we are not far from the kingdom of God. And we just might help some neighbors find their way there as well. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for these stories that you have preserved for us in the scriptures. Stories of everyday life, of a man like us, Jesus, making his way through life, encountering people and responding in ways ordained by your sovereign hand and prompted by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that Jesus has shown us the way, that it's a way that we can follow with the help of your Spirit. And so we pray that you might do this work in our hearts, that you might begin awakening us. Again, Lord, help us to do that even here at camp. We're neighbors to each other. Give us eyes and ears to notice and to feel and to pray. May you do a good work in our hearts. And I do pray, Lord, as each of us begin thinking about this chart in front of us, that there are people in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools that you have already ordained that we should bump into in the coming days and weeks and months. Lord, make us ready for those moments. Soften our hearts, open our eyes and ears, and ready our hands to respond as you give us opportunity. I pray for that young man, Andy, Lord, wherever he is right now. May you give him victory over this addiction that he's battling in his life. May you get him back on his feet again. May you lead him to a good job and to good people and good community. And may you lead him to a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Praying, Lord, that someday you might even put our hands together in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.